we're having this policy dialogue on land development simply because proper land development is integral to the achievement of the objectives of the project, which are primarily to increase production and productivity. There are many factors that go into that, but proper land development is key to that. And as you may know, several projects have had challenges dealing with this land development issue. So before Roots actually starts work on the ground, as far as land development is concerned, the intention is to gather all categories of stakeholders to discuss this conundrum and how to solve it. That is why we are here today. We have from the beneficiaries um, to the contractors to other projects here to share their experiences. That is the purpose of uh, our gathering today and that is the link between land development and uh, our uh, objectives, project development objectives. Yes, they indeed um, identified several challenges. Uh, some of them uh, include the capacity of our national contractors. Um, this is particularly the case uh, when it comes to um, it is particularly the case when it comes to uh, access to equipment. And that's a national challenge, actually. Uh, there are also other constraints uh, which include factoring in the fact that those beneficiaries for which the land is being developed have labor challenges themselves uh, brought about by the rural urban migration meaning the able-bodied men and women are no longer in the rural areas as they used to be. So when you invest in land development, you also have to look at uh, ways to um, remove or minimize the drudgery and make it easier for the older population to benefit. Uh, these are some of the challenges. A third one is uh, the, fact, the, the consolidation versus expansion debate. Why don't you improve on what already exists rather than starting something new with all the environmental challenges? These are some of the challenges that have been highlighted today. Okay, um, our mandate is to develop uh, or undertake land development activities that would impact on uh, about uh, 5,800 hectares for rice cultivation across the country. Now, um, the total hectare of this country is about a million. Out of that, um, 450,000 hectares are cultivable actually. And cultivable does not mean cultivated. Uh, it means you can do agriculture, but it is also being used for other purposes such as uh, forestry. Uh, so if we're doing 5,800, it is big, but relative to the total hectare of this country, it's not so much. So it begs the question, what will be the impact on our rice self-sufficiency quest? Uh, we need about 200,000 tons, roughly, uh, a year. If you cultivate 5,800, let's say 6,000, then yield is important. Hence this land development uh, question again. With proper land development, uh, you can raise the yields to 5, 6 tons per hectare. So 6 tons, I'm trying to do the math here. Six tons per hectare for 6,000 hectares is just 36,000 tons against 200,000 tons. So you are now talking about double cropping or having two cropping cycles or even three in the year if possible to be able to meet the target. But the last and most important point is roots is not the sole um, effort 
actually towards this rife self-sufficiency. There are other projects, there are other government interventions, so roots will contribute to the overall objective. But in the current design, given the current hectare, it would be difficult for roots by itself to achieve the self-sufficiency target. Build on uh, the gains of these former projects that have at least, um, what's the name again, um, um, done some kind of development uh, when it comes to land development. The target areas for the project is uh, the five main, five districts within the country, excluding, excluding the Greater Banjul area. We have the West Coast and LR, um, NBR and CRR, CRR and URR. So we have 39 districts that we are, we are, we are, um, we are implementing some of, some of our the, the, the project. The main objective of the project, like I've mentioned earlier, uh, those challenges um, is to improve the food security, nutrition, and smallholder farmer resilience to climate change. And the project development um, objective is to increase agricultural productivity and access to market for enhanced food security and nutrition and resilience of family farms and farmer organizations. The project is divided into three components. You have component one, which is um, uh, agricultural productivity and adaptation to climate change, where you have the land development and support to farmer um, capacity development. Uh, and you have the component two, which is access to market, which um, is mainly um, intervening on the building of capacity or enhancing the, what, what's the name again, the, the marketing of uh, farmer produce um, and also the capacity building of um, women cafos and um, farmer organizations in how to market their, their, their products. And you have the component three, which is project management, institutional development, and citizen engagement. As I've mentioned, um, on the component one, where you have the land development, we, ha we are intervening on um, Jahali, which, is, which was presumed to be 1,000 hectares, um, that is conversion from pump irrigation to tidal irrigation, as mentioned in the project document. And the Pachar, which is uh, also 1,000, 15, 15 hectares, which was, which was also presumed to, to be transformed from pump irrigation to tidal irrigation. And we also have the Sukuta, and the Nyani, which is 105 hectares. Nyani, that is 105 hectares. Barajali Suba, 380 hectares, which is supposed to be a new tidal irrigation system. And Barajali Tenda, which is 40 hectares. And we have all, all the areas to be identified for cultural irrigation, which is 1,200 hectares. And we are also intervening on micro catchment. Sorry, we are also intervening on micro catchment um, cascaded dikes like the ones in Jurunku. Um, we are supposed to intervene on 400 hectares. Um, and we have also um, causeways like the ones in Toyataba. And we are also, uh, also intervening on cascaded dikes like um, valley bottom dikes which are uh, found in the, like Nemban, Nemban Jola. During um, the course of the project, in the initial stages, we carried out an, uh, 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 what's the name again, a field assessment based on what, we have, what it was in the project document. And we carried out a, uh, what's the name again, a survey to verify if the area that we are given in the document is still available for, for um, intervention. But during the course of the control, community control, participatory consultation that we carried out to verify this, we were able to find that um, the actual area for Jahali was 736 hectares. But out of that area, um, and for, uh, for that of ja Pachar, because um, the RVCD project was is also intervening in that area, I think around 500 hectares. So, the, the actual, uh, what is available right now there is around 423, which is available. Uh, and now the deficit, based on what is, what, what is found in the document, is 592 hectares. Um, for Pachar, for Suta, sorry, um, 
we find out that like they have already taken the place so we have a deficit of 105 which um we have to transfer somewhere else um the barajali suba also uh instead of find uh 380 hectares what we were able to find is 97 hectares so we have a deficit of 283 hectares the actual is 39 which is almost 40 hectares so it um the one hectare there is um not very relevant here and the damfakunda which was supposed to be 360 hectares what we found there is only 70 hectares so we have a deficit of 290 hectares so um if you add up all like the deficits now we're having like 2735 hectares from the what's the name again the the total of 4100 hectares so we normally construct dikes and spillways causeways bridges culverts which are normally combined access roads and culverts uh, they're all in this system you have canals for irrigation and drainage in some cases the same canal can serve as a drainage and irrigation canal. This is very common in tidal irrigation. Pump irrigation, the, irri the irrigation canal is raised high. So that by gravity, it can, you can irrigate the field. And the field is also higher than the drainage canal. So that if you want to drain, you open it and it will drain into the drainage canal which will go back into the river but with tidal irrigation the same canal serves as a as an irrigation canal and a drainage canal why it is just like nature itself the river is the same trench which brings water when it's high tide and when it's draining low tide it goes back in the same thing so I mean, tidal irrigation is just like that. The main canal, when the river is high, high tide, it will enter when you open the gates. At low tide, when you open the gates, it will go back with the river. So the same canal is for tide, I mean, for irrigation and drainage in tidal. But in pump irrigation, you have two canal systems. The one that irrigates and the one that drains. They are different. Okay. So we have gated bridges and culverts. These are the ones which control the, the, the inflow and the outflow. Some are automatic, but they are called flap gates, but some call them automatic because you don't have to be there to operate them. They operate by the force of water. The, the inlet uh, gates can be inside or outside, depending on the function they are doing. But that one has to be operated by somebody then you have uh that's why i say you have other gates in the canal system sometimes the entire land cannot be same level and it cannot be the same level so you have to have some gates in some of the canals so that you deprive some blocks of water because you don't have much and the others will be irrigated and you have pipes and pipe obtenances. This word looks very unfamiliar with many people. That's why I try to describe what it means. It's the structural elements necessary to provide efficient hydraulics, structural integrity, effective water tightness, because leakage, you have to reduce that, and uh, adequate percolation path easy access for inspection and maintenance because sometimes you have to move from one side to another for maintenance and uh, effective safety one has to make sure people don't fall into canals and the like these are all when i say pipe it doesn't mean metal pipe alone some uh, concrete then the most difficult part is the leveling the fields must be leveled according to what are the purpose so level fields and properly subdivided plots with their earthen embankment bonds we can well you we have to share it between the farmers after all okay the types of structures for various rice land ecologies you see dikes we mentioned dikes and spillways construction in inland valleys bounds as we call it in the forges and bandafaros 
these are found in the West Coast, LVR and LRR mostly, but they are all found elsewhere too. They help to protect rice fields from salt intrusion, if it is in the LRR and LVD and West Coast, because of the nature of our rivers. And uh, they also impound fresh runoff that would have been wasted in the river. But if impounded, it can serve as a I mean, buffer against the drought between two rainy seasons. Especially sometimes you have rain now and then it won't come until three weeks when the rice needs it. But if you impound the water, that will be uh, that danger will be reduced. That risk will be reduced. I'm mentioning these things like that so that you know. As I said, we are not trying to define what successes are. We are trying to avoid the failures. You see. So if you know their meanings and uh, what they stand for, you can avoid mistakes in them. That's why the project needs to know if at all the particular place has potential acid sulfate uh, elements there, then they should put lime into the course. Otherwise, you still don't get your maximum production. Okay? So, the other one is the involvement of, or at least informing district authorities. It's good that you invited the chiefs here. These people are very important. Because sometimes you end up uh, dispute. Some farmers, let's say, uh, example, Jan Mikoto, it was difficult to start because the Jatakunda clan didn't want their land, they were producing from it. They said, if you include it in this, uh, now you want us to share with other people, and we are getting rights already, you know, it's an issue. You see? So that's why during the reconnaissance survey, all these things should be done. The chiefs and the the alcalos normally are aware, but the chiefs and the, even up to governor level, if necessary, let them be aware of your interventions. Then cannot be correct if at all you don't know the shape of the land. Because four hectares can be 400, I mean, uh, four, four, four hundred, uh, let's say one hectare can be 100 by 100, that's square. It can be 50 by 200. You know, stuff like that. So it can be even uh, uh, 1,000 by 1 meter. You see? So shape is very important. How do you design a system without knowing the shape of the field? And to know the shape of the field, the owners must tell you, you cannot pass here because this side belongs to uh, Pakalinding our boundary stops here. So those who will find that out depend on the, uh, the, the, the social people, because some people go to the field to be shown by the, uh, the engineers and the soil scientists will go, go along with some people. But the elders remain at home. But while these people are going, they'll tell them, uh, you see that big tree, you see that, they, they start to describe. So that uh, big tree, that thing, uh, is the extent where you must not pass. I see. So you cannot design uh, sitting on the table here and design for Nemakunku when you have not been to Nemakunku. So some of the land, as you said, are suitable, and you can go in and just start cultivating. But then this is all, some of the land is suitable and irrigable. But the important thing is that all land needs products protection. If you remove, if you, the ecology is changed in one form or the other, you need to do something to make sure that uh, that change in the ecology doesn't affect the nature of the soil. Next slide, please. Now, in the, document, the recommendation in the LR22, soil and water management was created in the department in about 1978 to address the emerging issue of soil erosion. The establishment of the unit and training of original core staff was funded by USID. Field work started in the early 80s with resource passing from the U.S. Soil Conservation Service, SCS. Eligible passing was selected from the Department of Agriculture for training in the U.S., agronomy, engineering, soil science, range management, etc. Another group went to Nigeria for higher development in general agriculture. The trainees returned to field positions in the various sections of the unit, engineering, soil, agronomy, and planning. In short, 
This section's work to carry out reconnaissance survey of selected project sites, produce soil and intervention map, and supervise implementation of conservation activities. Major of the work by USID was dike construction in the valleys and soil line rice fields to control soil intrusion and impound water for rice cultivation. Dike construction was based on was, was on uh, digital basis. Project provided tractor and plow to loosen the soil and volunteers from the community will load uh, uh, the trailer for haulage to the dike site. At the beginning, we are building big dikes. We only call it road dikes. The tractor can run on the dike. So the people only fill the trailer too, and the trailer will go and sort of, uh, I mean, spread it on the dike, and then you do compaction. And uh, we'll come to that later. Then afterwards, uh, we are building soil line dikes, which are longer and smaller. That's the time when we had uh, uh, what we call head pants and spades. The, when the tractor does the ply, losing the soil, the men and some women will also, you know, uh, uh, use those head pans to hold the soil to the dike side. Okay, and uh, after USID, after phased out, GTZ, now GIZ, uh, came in and then um, uh, to fund SWMS, uh, Special Water Management uh, Conservation Projects. Uh, GDZ programs were confined to the south of the country. The projects also concentrated on control of salt for intrusion and water retention in the soil line rice fields and in NBR, LR, and West Coast. And there was an agro agroforestry program was very limited to a few villages in Fony, like uh, maybe Arangale, and I don't know remember. Yeah. The request assistant kept uh, coming, and SWMS kept implementing projects on the ground. Okay. Next slide, please. Uh, this was then, okay. The LIDAP came in after um, GTZ, and uh, the name implies LIDAP concentrated on lowland rice fields that essentially continued the work of the GTZ, but included CRR as well as uh, I mean, uh, Northern South. CRR Northern South. The overall goal of, the, of LIDAP was to sustainably improve traditional rice production system as a means of uh, enhancing security for impoverished rural households. The objective of the program is to increase total production in the traditional rice production system of the lowland by about 12,000 tons at the end of the project uh, life cycle. Um, uh, on sustainable base using community-based demand-driven development approach. However, all the Tessito hand-built uh, dikes in West Coast were redone mechanically by Galdem. A lot of uh, dike was constructed in the valleys in, in West Coast, really in the, Fui and uh, then Ladep, uh, Galdep came was a project that was only for West Coast region. Okay, well, actually, this tag, as I said, were done by hand. Some of them are very small. They have been even uh, uh, damaged or because, uh, because, uh, uh, by due to neglect. Because uh, maintenance of structure is a big issue in land development in this country. You build structures, you give your back, then they think that it belongs to the project. So they just neglect it and wait for another project. Any problem, they wait for another project to come and fix it. So these dikes, because we had committees in every village that were responsible for looking after these structures to mobilize uh, I mean the, the, uh, the community to or sort of uh, take care of whatever happens during the rains, uh, any damage, because these dikes, uh, during, the, during the dry season, the cattle sometimes go over them and they can cause some erosion. And these are weak points and in case there is a lot of heavy rainfall and the spillway, you know, the flow depth is, is higher than maybe what's allowance given, it can use those small depressions and can overtop the, the, the dike and break it. You know, and these things we always uh, rely on the community to fix them. And sometimes, you know, because these are hard structures, can also erode during the course of time because uh, not much grass grows on it, you know, especially those on the soil line because of the nature of the soil is salty. Before that soil leaches out, to allow grass to grow on it, it, uh, it may be the damage, you know. So then when Galdep came into West Coast, they, uh, I, I did the resolving everything, and they gave them the maps, and they, you know, they use uh, excavators to rebuild those dikes. And some of them, they also add maybe extra um, uh, uh, dikes in the valleys, and then they also rebuild some spillers that have been damaged.